Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you um, as we discuss um, the latest NIDSCRAM research into what COVID-19 has done to our economy, to our education system, and to our labor market. So even as we hit level one, our borders are open again, it's an important moment uh, to look at what's happened in those vital areas. Uh, we're currently joined by 300 people. It's very good to see all of you here. And so I'll start straight by introducing our panel is Nick Paul, who is the principal investigator for the NIDS-CRAM study. And very welcome Mpumi Moshlwane of the Department of Basic Education um, to take us through the key education findings. We'll have a much broader discussion on that. So Nick, if I may start with you. Um, you said in our chat that you found what, the landscape that COVID has left us with, you described as almost post-war-like or post-coup-like. I wonder if you could explain what you meant by that, please. Sure. Um, so I think that uh, when we're looking at the impact of COVID um, historically, the question is, when has this happened before? When have we lost yeah. more than 2 million jobs? Uh, the, the Treasury's estimates are that the economy will will decline by 7% this year. Uh, that's never happened. In 60 years that we've been measuring that, if you look at it, we've never had a recession like that. It's like yeah. four financial crises happening in the same year. Wow. Um, so those 2 million jobs that were lost, I mean, QLFS came out yesterday showing that 2.2 million people lost their jobs. That's the equivalent of a decade's worth of job growth. So that's why we're saying this is really as if this is a civil war or a coup uh, of the, probably the best references that we have. Mm. I just want to stay with you for a moment. So you're saying that in 10 years, we've wiped out any job growth. And that comes on top of a labor market that's already extremely vulnerable. Lots of inf a, a very big informal sector and a declining formal sector. How's, how's that looking now? Sure. So the, the big finding from our first wave of the study between February and April was that 2.8 million people lost their jobs. Now, the wave two was to see, did any of those jobs come back between April and June? And what we see is that the 2.8 million jobs are still being lost. They haven't returned. Um, now, that was between lockdown level five and lockdown level three. Now, whether yes. any of those jobs do come back uh, later in the year as we move to level one and having no lockdown whatsoever remains to be seen. Uh, but even the QLFS results are reporting similar levels of job loss. Uh, and between 2009 and 2019, Status A reports that we managed to create 2.4 million jobs in 10 years. So in a <laughs> sense, if, if these job losses uh, persist, we will have lost the equivalent of 10 years of job growth in six months. Wow. And when I was looking at the stats, it's a um, quarterly findings on, on Tuesday this week. What struck me is that so many more people are in that very vulnerable category of not in education or training. Um, and they so five million more people. I guess that's because of the lockdown. But do you see um, that 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 group of people getting smaller? Um, what are your your what do you think our, 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 what's it going to be like at level one once you do wave three of the study? Sure. So, I mean, I think some people were confused by the QLFS results where they said, yes. you know, how can the unemployment rate come down during a pandemic? Yeah, Everyone was expecting explain that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, basically, what happens is that you have a group of people uh, that moved from being unemployed uh, into this category of not economically active. So we have 5 okay. million more people in the category not economically active, which would typically be people that are retired or children or people like, uh, that are uh, housewives that don't want to work, our students that are currently studying. Um, but it's, it's irrational to think that between quarter one and quarter two, suddenly there were 5 million extra students, for example. Clearly, these people were just not able to leave their houses to go and look for work, which is the reason why they were then classified as not economically active. So I don't think it's actually very helpful to focus on that decline, inverted commas decline, in the unemployment rate yeah. because it's purely a definitional issue. Whereas those yeah. 2.2 million job losses, that's a much better indication of the kind of real economy and what's happening. 
Yeah, so we'll get back to that. Um, Pumi, very welcome to you. Do you come to us from the Department of Basic Education or are you still working from home right now? Um, so we are back 100% working um, all governments since level one. Um, so okay. yeah, along with teachers are all back uh, at our workplaces. Okay, so when I was reading this research, I suppose there's lots of parts of it which left me very sad and worried for our country. But the part most of all was that it's such a picture of devastation for our country's young people and what the lockdown did to, to schooling. I wonder if you could take us through some of those key findings of, of which you were part of, uh, the research of which you were part of. Sure. Um, so I'll reflect firstly on the ECD um, research that my colleagues um, and other authors were part of. Um, yes. And I think the big things we see there is that um, only 25% of children have returned uh, to school. This, this is children that are between zero and six. Uh, I don't yes. think the zero actually go, but that's the category. Um, and this is 25% of pre-lockdown um, levels. But also yes. if you try to compare when in time did we see similar attendance, uh, this was in the early 2000s. So we've about 18 years um, of enrollment um, is now not seen um, as, as opposed to in 2002. Uh, those were the comparable um, timeframes. Um, and what this means, I think, is we know that uh, early stimulation um, is important for the development of children. So schooling or getting ready to be able to learn doesn't start when you're in grade R or in grade one. We need ECD centers to be doing this early stimulation work. And so if children mm. are not in these centers, uh, what are they doing? How are they being occupied? How are they mm. being stimulated? And I think even prior to lockdown, um, there was um, high stats or alarming stats in the country about stunting. Um, in terms of children and we know that these centers often provide a meal for children and so again um, speaking on hunger in general in the country mm -hmm. um, being in an ECD center it influences this um, and, then, and then I think thirdly in terms of ECD it's what is happening to these children that are not in these centers are they not part of the economic conversation of parents not being able to look for work um, or yeah um, earn an income because they're looking after children we know that mm -hmm. this Particularly affects women, so almost seventy percent of that child caring is happening through women. Um, mm. And then I think moving on to basic edu basic education sector, yes. um, we've seen um, thankfully the good news is up more than about eighty eight percent of grade twelve learners at school. Um, so grade twelve learners have had the least interrupted schooling. I think it's good that that's been protected. It has implications for higher education in twenty twenty one. Uh, that has implications for comparability, right? We don't want to have a disadvantaged group of grade 12s, the ones we see as the not so, not comparable to 2019 or yes. 2018, right? So in terms of university, but also in the workforce, we, we, don't, we, we don't want to carry that in, in the long term. So that's been good. But what has been alarming or jarring has been how yes. the wealthiest 10% um, of the population have been sending or being able to attend school um, for closed grades. So we had the staggered reopening um, and for those learners, uh, grades were completely open, but schools could apply to the provincial department to have additional grades open mm -hmm. if they were able to comply with all sorts of um, uh, standard operating procedures for COVID. And you see that the wealthiest 10% were in fact able to do this. And you have almost 50% of the wealthy accessing school when the rest of the majority were not going to school. So I think that that is something um, that should we should worry about and that exacerbates inequality. Mm. And then I think another thing that maybe is important for us as a conversation is previously leading up to now, there's been this tension, including court cases, several court cases about not opening schools. Um, and, and the sentiment that parents are worried being true um, but that being used as the reason we should not open schools. But what we in fact see in the survey is parents are able to both be worried and send their children to school. So it's not that if you're sending your child to school, it means you're not worried about them. It's recognizing the learning that needs to happen. So we see high levels of worry, but we also see same parents sending their children to school. So I think, yeah, mm -hmm. that's important 
for us to consider moving forward. That yeah, mm. the pandemic is. Well, were you surprised? Uh, were you surprised, Mpumi, by that twenty five percent ECD figure? Um, but, I mean, because that reverses vital gains in early childhood education access. Um, and then I also want to talk about this deepening in inequality that you see in education. So, so please, Mpumi, and then Nick, I know it's a passion area of yours. So come in after that, please. Sure. I think we were surprised. Oh, I was surprised. But um, we know that in ECD, there it's not as highly subsidized as the basic education sector or the rest of schooling, I guess. And there's this... Um, private sector component that's um, quite large um, and we also know that the in order to comply with these COVID um, requirements in terms of hygiene and practices ECD yes. center owners would have to themselves spend this money um, during a time when parents are earning less money than what they used to earn so this idea of rising costs um, but not uh, a way to compensate for these costs and therefore it's not entirely surprising I mean, I think secondly, just it's ECD is more fragmented than um, basic education. So for us, you know, we have 95% of children in public schools, private schools mm. are schools in South Africa. But if you think of the ECD sector, it, there are lots of informal gogos, crash, et cetera. So sort of, it's very hard to count them. It's very hard to support them. And even leading up to this, they were not able to comply with um, requirements to get subsidies. So they were much more fragile even prior to lockdown. Mm. And it's more fragile now. Um, Nick, do you want to come in on the education findings and what challenges they, they hold for us as a, as a society? Sure. I mean, I agree with Mpumi there around ECD as being a really critical one. Uh, so she mentions there that, you know, ECD is not as highly subsidized uh, as basic yeah. education. I mean, that's a massive euphemism, right? So the amount that we, the public, uh, the government <laughs> spends on ECD say? less than is less than 2% of what we spend on basic education. Uh, so ECDs primarily are run as small businesses, um, gogos and often young women that are taking mm -hmm. care of children and charging fees to the children's parents uh, to take care of them. So yes. during the lockdown, obviously those children were not going uh, and those businesses that were essentially being run uh, no longer became viable. Uh, and now that there are additional barriers like having to have certain levels of PPE before you're allowed to reopen, uh, those are some of the constraints that those small businesses are facing, which means that one and a half million kids are still staying at home. Um, and I think the important research there was that it wasn't because parents don't want to send their kids back. When we asked them, why haven't they gone, the 65% of the reasons, two thirds, were that the center was still closed. It was a supply side reason. Do you know what I mean? We want to send our kids, but the, the, it's actually not open yet. So that's yes. a critical thing with ECD. And I think that we need to target subsidies and find ways of channeling some of the government support to this really vulnerable sector in ECD. Um, Thank you. On the schooling front, yes. Um, if I can just mention one thing there, I mean, I think that we, again, this is exacerbating our inequalities. We've always had two schooling systems in South Africa. Uh, and what this is showing is that if you tend a fee charging school, your school is operational. If you don't, it's not. Uh, I think it's a good time for us to reflect and say, do we not need some more fundamental reforms in the basic education sector? And if not now, then when? We'll get to those uh, four inequalities which, which we've been speaking about. Pumbi, I want to ask you this. Our country has done a lot to unwind the legacies of of Bantu education. Many people say not enough, but if you look at the money, if you look at the effort, a lot has gone into it. Do you think that that's been unwound, that that's been reversed in the course of this one year, or is that to bleak a, a look at our education landscape? I think, um, firstly, I, I think a report that would be useful um, on this comes from wave one of um, NITS. It's done by Gustafsson and Nuga Deliwe. I'm sure we'll share the link in the chat. Um, yes. They do a good job of explaining the status of education in the country. So how far are we, how much have we progressed? And I think it's worth noting that we have been seen as one of the fastest improving countries, considering that we're a developing country. 
over the past yes. 15 years. And so um, we were on a, a good path, a developmental path. This is not to say we should we should not lament the low levels of learning, but I think we don't do enough about crediting teachers and the system for how far we have come. So that's where we were in March. We were on the yes. path of being comparable to Egypt, hopefully, if we were participating in international assessments in yes. 2021. Is that a if good thing to be close to Egypt? Yes, I would think, um, considering... Okay, I, I don't know, yeah. yeah. And, and in a few years' time, it would have been Malaysia. Okay, that, that, that I don't know. <laughs> so I think you, you ask a valid question, what are we comparing to, which, who should we be aspiring to be like? And I think that's the sad, almost the unfortunate part of education systems. Change is slow, um, change is gradual, um, but we were on a positive path, um, albeit at, a low, at the low end of international assessments when we participate, but considering our condition, a developing country where we start from on a positive path. And so in that paper, um, the authors do a good job of trying to model um, learning loss. So considering the amount of time we've lost, how far back are we going? And I think it's it's important to understand that if we don't intervene, if we don't focus on curriculum, if we don't have concerted efforts to try and make up um, in some ways, and I mean, make up is a different, we can get into that, building better, et cetera. But the point being, right. if we don't get on learning, uh, we are on a path of catching up only in 2030. Yeah. So it would take us, <laughs> 10 years to get to where we would have gotten to if we hadn't been interrupted. But wow. if we have um, concerted efforts, if we have remedial support, so post COVID or from now, keeping schools open, keeping learning going, as soon as 2023, we should be back on the path that we were going to be back on. So massive difference. It could take us three years. It could take us 10 years. It depends on how much effort we put into getting learning mm -hmm. back um, on track. That's interesting. I just want to stay with you for a bit because I was interested earlier. You said eighty-eight percent of uh, um, public of the public schools are now back and running, and I think you said that uh, public schools make up maybe a huge percentage of our education um, pie, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, eighty-eight percent of matrix had been attending. Um, during lockdown, so July, June until August. But now I think I read an update this morning that between 80 and 90% of all learners are now back at school. Um, and I think this is important in this time. I mean, th those are fairly high numbers. Um, and I think for the first, what is interesting is for the first time, not sending your child back to school is allowed. Um, before this, if you were within the compulsory schooling yes. years, it's illegal to keep your child at home unless they are registered for homeschooling, right? Um, there are mm. still, there's still permission and concessions you need to get, but actually- And I parents, believe they're very tough to get. Eh? A friend of mine was telling me, it's good. <laughs> but I think in this time, that's been maybe a new thing of parents have been, have more freedom to keep their children at home. Um, the call is to allow children to go back to school and to encourage parents, but it's not illegal uh, to do that. Um, and But maybe worth mentioning, um, once we get away from attendance, uh, I think the rotational timetabling is concerning. So in order mm -hmm. for us in public schools to adhere to COVID-19 um, protocols, there are all sorts of different ways that the school day is being timetabled or the school week. Um, some learners are attend, some schools make a decision, some are attending half in the morning, half in the afternoon. Um, classes are being divided, some attend twice a week, some attend yes. three times a week. And so th those kinds of things moving forward are what we need to rethink um, because it means then children have not only lost the times when their grades were closed, there's actually more time that they may be losing because they're not in school for a full five days like they normally would have been. Yeah. But that it poses great. I just want to greet some of the audience who've joined us, 343 people. Edwin, welcome. Bernard Kirshner says, best way to get back to normal, get some of the jobs back. Um, I've got a private conversation here. There were schools that couldn't even reopen because basic services like sanitation were not available. We can come to a school readiness. Um, hello to Stephanie Terra Blanche. Rob Head, thank you for the insights. John Batwell. Um, so Cheslin Francis asks our first question. Nick, job growth is clearly key. 
what are the immediate two to five year processes that we can implement to reverse this bloodbath? So I think one of them, I mean, job uh, job growth was difficult even pre-COVID, right? I mean, uh, yeah. every spin in every single election manifesto, depending on which one you look at, you know, one million jobs, yeah. five million jobs, two million jobs, somehow these jobs are coming, but they never do. So I yeah. think that it's going to be even more difficult in the post-pandemic scenario to uh, to get more jobs. But I think it's probably dependent on two things. One is business confidence around whether or not the economy is improving and whether they should be expanding and hiring more people or rehiring labor that they retrenched or furloughed. But the second one, which is, I have more hope in the second one than that first one, uh, is public employment systems. So a really big public push around infrastructure, big infrastructure programs, Around the world, we're seeing government's role as being far more central in this reconstruction period than we would typically expect. So I think all eyes are on government to see what are those plans and are we going to be able to get money out the door and hire people in those projects and how quickly can they do that? So I've, I think if you've seen the, the NEDLAC economic recovery plan uh, drafts which are floating about, they do speak about a, a job-centered growth path. We've seen this before. Um, do you feel like public works on infrastructure, and this is for either Nick or Pumi, is, is a good way to go to, to rapidly soak up all this um, extra labor that, we've, that we're now seeing being put into the labor market? So, um, well, I, don't think you both so no, I want to add or push back on something you said, Nick, and then you can answer. It'll be a combination. So I agree on, on, on infrastructure um, being a big opportunity. I mean, we've had um, serious problems in basic education on infrastructure, and I imagine these will be even higher for ECD centers that are less formal. Um, but I do want to know, Nick, um, your thoughts on the tension between government trying to stimulate the economy and create jobs through things like infrastructure and the um, parallel mandate of government spending the least amount of money to get services. So specifically, I'm speaking about things like providing toilets, right? So the basic education sector has had big scandals around um, pit latrines, etc. But when government procures these toilets, the cost of the toilet is three times um, what a private sector cost would be or an individual cost would be. So how do we manage that? Shouldn't, even though government is, is can participate in stimulating um, the economy, having sort of price caps um, in big ways on things like basic infrastructure and not paying, yeah, not non-market related prices for um, services. Mpumi, may I come in here? Because this is a, a topic I think that's front and center of our national imagination. The story of what we call PPE uh, corruption is also often one of preferential procurement that's just gone crazy, where what the government's paying for infrastructure, goods and services has no bearing on, on pricing. Um, and this is what you're talking about. And clearly, I mean, the Department of Basic Education has rolled out a marvelous school building scheme. What's been your experience of trying to get those costs down and competitive in the way that you've suggested? Because education infrastructure is a big part of the NEDLAC uh, economic recovery plan. Huh? I think it's, so, so the examples I'm citing in terms of toilets are real. It's that yeah. the pricing you get once you issue a tender, this, these are the prices you get. And out of the five people that bid and qualify to build um, the toilets, they all are giving you above market related prices. Yes. I, I think what's been a maybe short term or maybe should be long term remedial approach has been working with the private sector. So there've been all sorts of companies that are saying we want to partner, we want to help. And then you get them to directly build those toilets without it being government funds that are useful for doing that. But I don't think it's a basic education issue. This is a national treasury um, public works conversation about oh, regulating sure. prices. There are other ways in which we are able to regulate things, right? So salaries are largely stated, issued every year. We all know how much each person at each level is supposed to get paid. And I think similar things could be done on procurement. Um, so having a range that's publicly known, uh, yes. and we won't pay more than this uh, to get services. 
Yep, that's very important. Lovely questions, Nick. I'm going to just read some of them. Um, <clears throat> what has been specifically identified un under the umbrella term infrastructure from John Battle? I'll quickly answer it. And please join me. It's social infrastructure like education. Um, mostly it's bridges, roads, railway, and transport infrastructure. And then obviously the big one is energy infrastructure. So um, renewable energy, um, independent power, power power production, etc. So Charles Unwin, intermittent employment is counted as employment. Intermittent employment are counted as jobs, but they may only last a week. We've had a, a couple of these. Don't you think it's time to re-examine our language or our classification around employment to reflect the on the level ground living conditions? Nick, you want to take this one? Sure. So I think it actually does speak back to this earlier question and Pumi also added one there around infrastructure. Yeah. Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons why it does make sense to focus on infrastructure. Yeah. One is that the largest job losses between February and June were actually amongst manual laborers and the poor. Uh, so 50% okay. of the people who were manual laborers or in the poorest half of the population have lost their jobs. Uh, so targeting the recovery for that same industry, I think, makes a lot of sense. The second one is that I think it speaks to what we call a no regrets policy. In other words, if right. we have a better infrastructure in the country, uh, in 10 years time, we won't look back and think of that as being wasted money. If we now have schools yeah. that have toilets, if we have bridges and roads that work, et cetera. Whereas I'm sure we could all think of 10 things that government could spend money on that's going to be a white elephant. Um, right. So I, well, infrastructure is not one of them. But if I can, that I wanted to tell you, and Pumi had a story there about saying, you know, how do we make sure that government is not going to pay these exorbitant prices? Yeah. When Praveen Gordon took over SARS, uh, there was this sort of apocryphal story, but maybe one of your listeners can tell us if it's true. So he, he comes into SARS and he takes out this double page ad in the Financial Mail or the Business Day or whatever it is that businessmen read. And it's he's welcoming these two hotshot tax lawyers that he had hired into SARS from the leading agencies, the tax agencies that were advising the big corporates. And it was something right. like within 72 hours, had a whole lot of things coming in saying, oh, we mistook our tax, you know, we've submitted it, we've resubmitted it, and now we've just paid 100 million rand extra type of thing. Uh, and I think that that's something that we actually need to be doing is that uh, the DBE, for example, needs to be hiring a whole lot more civil engineers to be looking at this and saying, this is bullshit. Like these prices you're giving us are nonsense. You inflated these by five times. The problem is that the people that are reviewing those budgets and approving them, when it's not uh, in, when it's not kind of overt corruption, it's incompetence. They don't actually have the skills to review the budgets to make uh, make sense of whether they are inflated or not. Uh, and then the other one is just to have some symbolic prosecutions. So where we have had PPE uh, procurement that is illegal, we actually need some yeah. of those people in orange suits. So that that is a deterrent to subsequent contracts uh, and bids, etc., to to deter them from that. Uh, I think we need both of those. Yeah, absolutely. So the lovely questions. I'll just read a few more for all comments from Riaz Jacobs. This pandemic is a massive catalyst for change, and we've had quite a few questions. So maybe the idea of reset, how we work, how we educate and learn, and how we prep ourselves from for the next crisis to keep the economy going and preserve or create jobs. Um, between climate change, political turmoil globally, and the threats of further pandemics, no normal is no longer a thing. So Mpumi, this idea of a reset, how how would how, do you, how is the Department of Basic Education thinking about that in how we shape future, future education? You've, you've touched on some of it, but perhaps a few more thoughts. Eh? Sure. Um, just the last comment on Nick's infrastructure, um, sure. getting the right experts um, around the table or hired permanently. I think that's a big thing. And I think that's something that's come from um, the SAFE initiative around sanitation, a whole group of people that are, are targeted and focusing on infrastructure as their expertise rather than mm -hmm. as you know a side duty you do now that you are at the department of basic education and now we have a crisis so i think that's super valid i'm 100 percent agree with that then if we think of building better um i think um or preparing for the future i think infrastructure to finish off the infrastructure thing is an important one we've had serious sanitation um issues uh, and water supply issues that didn't start now, there've been issues and solving those things for the future will be helpful. I think it's part of why um, the wealthiest amongst us are able to go to school 
um, at a higher rate than the rest of public schooling is because they have sufficient numbers of classrooms. They have um, sufficient toilets and water. So getting those kinds of things right in general as a human right now, mm. but as a human right that will um, will work for us in the future is important in terms of preparing for future pandemics. I think a second one, if we go into the classroom or content wise, um, we had all hoped that technology would be a big um, relief in terms of providing yes. access uh, to education outside classrooms, but we know that this is not the case, right? So we've seen that even though some schools have been able to continue learning, this is not happening in the majority of schools. This is not happening for the majority of children. And so I think as a long-term issue, the technology infrastructure of the country should be addressed. That's not a, a DBE necessarily, yes. issue, but as a country, if we think we are going to need to be able to access education, access work, etc., from remote or different locations, that's a long-term investment we need to work on. But I think often- And may I ask what that looks like um, for me? Is that cheaper data? Is it better signal? Um, Releasing more spectrum. iPad, phone, spectrum? All of that. So there was, um, there was something called Operation Pagisa, and I think yes. led by the DPME, um, partnering with international donors and different departments and finding things that we could, um, I guess Pakisa means free, um, we could do quickly uh, for long-term gains. And they, there were things said about fisheries and um, water, but there were also things said about technology. And there was this massive costing of what it would take to have technology available um, acro across all schools um, yes. to learners etc and the costs were exorbitant it was great it was going to be our whole education budget for the next five years to get technology wow. um out sure, so it should be cheaper why, than there yeah mm. and it, and they, that's why it needs to be a national issue that we're speaking about rather than a basic education etc issue mm. universities were much better and geared for this right so lots of students were able to get loan laptops for those that didn't have laptops and able to I continue to access um, some form of remote learning from home. Mm -hmm. But I think if we're talking about technology, it's also important for us to move away from just the infrastructure. Infrastructure obviously important as the enabler, but we need to be talking about content. What content are we going to share with children once we have the infrastructure? So yeah, I think we often caught with the tablet, one tablet a child or one teacher smart board. Yes, okay, yes. that's all good. But what's the basic package that in terms of subscription, software licensing, is it available in all African languages in grade one, two and three, et cetera, working on those things over the next five or 10 years that are tested, that children can work at a self-paced rate or they should be mm. mediated, et cetera. Not that they don't exist, but often they've been used by the private sector, by Quintel Five schools. Can you scale them up? Can we all access them? I would say those are sort of the long-term um, remote learning preparations. But I think in terms of uh, curriculum, there's been a curriculum trim that the department has introduced. Uh, maybe um, some people would see this as a good thing. They've, there's been long, long conversations about the yes. curriculum being overpacked. Um, yes, and maybe. at the same time, also call for the introduction of things like robotics. Um, yeah, the tension of we want more, but we want less. Um, and mm. I think we are for the first time maybe engaging with that substantively. So I'm uh, right. looking at what are core skills. Um, I know in, in some grades, um, subjects like life skills, which are incredibly important, especially in a time like this, um, where you learn about hand washing, um, pandemics, where you learn about uh, social emotional learning, uh, are now being more deliberately incorporated into home language and English. And so being Good. used as the themes for that. And so maybe protecting more time. So doing less um, and doing it more intensively so that there is less teaching that a teacher needs to get through um, to allow for Thank more you. deep learning. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so many questions about how we're going to pay for this all, Nick. Um, lots of um, lots of businesses have gone to the wall, says Ahmed Kaji. Um, Graham Hill, perhaps re relaxing many of the impediments to small business might encourage more people to employ people. Um, Nick, could you take some of those questions of how do we fund this gap? You've said um, perhaps better uh, tax collection. 
a bit of pricing in the public sector. How, what else have you thought of? Eh? Sure. I mean, one of them, I think, is that government needs to uh, increase its capacity of getting money out the door when it has it available. Uh, you know, speed, time is of the essence here. Uh, it's not just a case of government doesn't have the money. It's can government also get that money out the door and into the hands of business owners uh, and employees? Uh, that's critical. As but critical can I, as can I step back one, I'm not sure government has the money anymore. I was reading an article by Kubin Naidu, the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank, and he says, we've kind of soaked up all the savings and might now have to borrow internationally to fund these, these spending plans. What do you say to that? Huh? So, I mean, I think that's definitely true, but some of the already allocated money, so the part when Kubin okay. is saying you know, this has already been allocated, it's not as if it's allocated and spent. It's sort of it's been allocated to an infrastructure problem or to an, an employment initiative, oh. but it hasn't actually been money out the door. So uh, getting it out the door is point is legit, though. Um, mm. I think that that point is legit that we are going to have to find a way to pay for all of these things, and where is that money going to come from? Mm. Uh, and in a sense, you you've got three options. One is right. you increase taxes. Uh, so this could be something like uh, taxing super profits. I mean, uh, ShopRite check is registered at 8 billion rand profits. Uh, now, that's, these are special times. We call for special measures. So taxing super profits of uh, retail sector probably is one of them, uh, and I think would probably be justified. A second one is increasing debt, so borrowing more money from somewhere. The problem is that our rate of borrowing is obviously much higher now than it was in the past, and the more debt we take on, the higher that rate uh, that interest rate is going to be. And the third one is doing more with less, so doing more with what we have, things like tackling corruption. Why are we paying five times as much or ten times as much for PPE than we should be? Uh, and that's about tackling corrupt politicians and corrupt processes and getting rid of uh, some of the public sector employment uh, which is not needed, uh, that people are not doing their jobs and probably shouldn't be employed, uh, cutting down that the... the or increasing the efficiency of the state. None of those things are popular. So it's a really difficult no, thing for government to do. But, but how does one make these balances? So your research uh, showing up uh, many more job losses than, than what uh, stats SA has found this week. It's 2.8 million. And then the numbers of furloughed people who found they didn't have a job to go back to. So if you're saying, on the other hand, that perhaps increase a, a tax on super profits, a wealth tax, etc. How do you balance that need to imp, uh, improve business confidence so that people start investing more and therefore um, grow, make more jobs uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, taking steps that are difficult to do, in, in like, in, like you've said, in each of those three policy options? And also, it feels to me like government really can't tackle those the 1.3 million size civil service sector because it's you you can't add to the joblessness burden yeah no i mean this is, these are the triple quadruple binds that government finds yeah. itself in right um, is how to do all of those things the taxing super profits one was just saying that there are certain sectors where this lockdown has actually benefited them uh, and if this was a war you know, when you started this webinar and you said the closest parallel that we have to talk about this is a war or a coup, yes. those are special times when you, you would introduce wartime measures. Uh, do you know what I mean? The fact that it's not a war doesn't mean that uh, I don't think that we could introduce some of those as long as they are mm -hmm. justified. A lot of this government spending that's gone to grants, that's gone straight into the, into the big retailers as uh, the informal sector wasn't able to reopen under lockdown, mm. for example. Um, and now, if we need to stimulate uh, the informal economy as well as manual laborers that lost their jobs, and we need to ask where is that money going to come from, I don't think that that is a, an irrational place to look for it. Um, but I think that the, the, the big role here is that we need to see governments stepping in. Uh, around the world, we see governments taking the role of, in times of serious crisis, you need uh, someone to kind of lift up the confidence of the country because business is not going to do that by itself. They will look to government to see this big push. Uh, and that's where it needs to be more than this talk mm. of what government is doing. Mpumi, do you want to come in there? I don't want to make you representative for all of government, but do you think this should be um, <laughs> state-led if you're in a post-war-like economy, then government leads the Marshall Plan, the RDP. There's many examples in the world. Eh? Singapore, I guess. 
I guess um, I'll come in on the uh, super profits of retailers that are selling food specifically um, and coming in from a um, population experience point of view. So in the same survey, we found that almost 50% of people experienced hunger. So even as a, as a humanitarian intervention, as a population, if we agree that there should be, if it's not super profit, some sort of, I don't know, co-subsidy from these same retailers that are benefiting um, from people buying um, food, uh, that would be something then that we can get consensus on, right? Rather than a violation of a constitutional right. Um, and so I think, we want to protect businesses. We want them to um, be part of a consultative um, process, but to also, I think, as Nick says, come to the party and maybe to revisit things like the right to food um, as a constitutional right. I, I mean, in the recent experience, the Department of Basic Education um, is now responsible for providing food to learners. And it's, it's no longer an auxiliary additional thing that the department has been doing for 20 years is now seen as a constitutional right. But maybe that creates a door to have more conversations mm. about who else can contribute to providing um, or securing similar rights. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I imagine mm. business would be open to a conversation around that. And so if I can stay with you, after the court case which said actually the department, the school nutrition feeding scheme has to go on because it's so vital to our young people's well-being, how has that rollout happened? So I think, um, yeah, I, I think initially in, in the NITSCRAM survey we saw that about 25% of all households uh, with children had reported their children eating or receiving a meal. So this is between June and July. Um, and just to give people an anchor number, this was like 90, 80% of children in the schooling system were getting a meal each day. So yeah. about 97 million children. Um, getting that down to about 25% was alarming, right? So, so many children that are no longer getting this meal. Um, I think the mm. first progress report uh, showed that this had increased to 60% by the end of August. And these are all publicly available reports filed with the court. There's this monthly okay. reporting to the court. Mm. Um, and then I think most, but part of what was hindering children's access still um, to the meals is access to schools. So I think one mm -hmm. of the key things that happened was a change or a, um, communication saying to children, you do not have to go to your own school to get a meal. You can go to any school around you to get a meal. Um, and so access to schools in terms of, yeah, closeness, proximity, but also learner transport and some of it being parent um, concern about children being um, unsupervised mm. each day going to get a meal. I think we expect these numbers to um, get back to pre-lockdown numbers now that all children are in school. So the normal routine of providing a meal at school in your own school um, is currently happening because we know 80% of children are at least back at school. Practice. So thank you very much, Impumi, for that on the ground um, information. Um, Nick, a quick comment, and then I'm going to ask a question about the grants. Government waste of taxpayer money has been out of control for many years to now increase taxes on any sector will not improve the situation because government controls are the problem. That's come up repeatedly in our chat here, Nick. Um, but I do want to ask you just to go back a little bit and share with us um, how those hunger levels Levels, um, came, you call it one of the brighter points of this research where, where the deep hunger we saw was abated by grants. Won't you share some of those that data for us, please? Sure. So one of the things that we see uh, in our data is that the levels of hunger and reported running out of money to buy food uh, has declined between April and June. So 22% of respondents said that their household had run out of money to buy food in May, June. And this has come mm -hmm. down to 16% in July, August. So it's come down by about a quarter. Now, importantly, right. that's still twice as high as pre-COVID levels. So it's not as if mm -hmm. we don't have a hunger problem. We really do. It's yes. just that the grants uh, and this kind of reopening of the economy do seem to be decreasing hunger um, somewhat. Mm -hmm. Now, I think a bigger, a bigger point here, and something Pumi touched on when she said that kids can now access the free school meal because uh, schools are now reopened, really I think we need to move back to a situation where they are fully open for all kids every day. This idea of platooning or to have shops and restaurants that are actually only at 30% capacity because we're trying to limit COVID 
Uh, we've had 16,000 deaths from COVID. That's like slightly higher than the number of deaths that happen from car accidents every year. Uh, 450,000 people die every year from something in South Africa. So the number of deaths are much, much lower than what we thought we were going to have. And we need to start weighing up these other costs when thinking about the path forward. Let's do, let's stay there for a bit, Nick. Um, so one of the questions we got from early registrants was, how do you make that balance? 16,000 lives saved. Discovery says by the end of the year, we'd have saved by their calculations, 18,000 lives um, versus 2.2 million people out jobs and maybe much higher, 2.8 million and maybe higher than that. So you've said to me, we must never do this lockdown again. Nick, mm. do you want to expand on that? The costs are just too high. I'd, I'd love first, Nick, and then Pumi, love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So maybe we start by recognizing that there was an incredible amount of uncertainty at the start of the pandemic. Yes. But the aim of saying that we should never lock down again is not to try and blame government for job losses or something like that. It's okay. to say Because nobody that knew what to do, right? Yes, exactly. It's yeah. kind of a forward-looking measure of knowing right. what we know now, what should we do? And I think knowing what we know now, we recognize the incredible social and economic costs of lockdown. It's not just jobs and it's not just livelihood. It's things like hunger, mental health rates that have doubled uh, around depressive uh, symptoms. All of those sorts of indicators are also as important uh, as minimizing deaths from one uh, virus, one disease uh, in this particular instance. What about all of the people that weren't screened for TB, HIV people that couldn't access, HIV positive people that couldn't access their medication, you know, various other knock-on effects of the lockdown, not just economic. Mm. Um, but I think I completely agree that most people recognize now that a nationwide lockdown is almost like a nuclear option. That even if there is a second wave of infections, we should not lock down again. The costs are simply too high. Too high. So Mpumi, from the former ambassador and MP Douglas Gibson, um, we know exactly how many people are unemployed. We do not know how many lives were saved. A crisp answer the quest to the question of whether it was worth it. Uh, what do you think, Mpumi? Just a, a crisp answer and then to explain. Huh? Sure. Um, I think in, in terms of schooling, at least, uh, um, the initial idea about locking down and having a phase reopening was well thought out. I'm glad though that there was a decision to fight to open schools. I would say we should now keep them open. So considering what we knew then, I would make the same decision probably. But now knowing what we do know and the low infection of children, yes. very low infection of children, uh, we should be yes. communicating that and keeping schools open. Thank you. So Douglas, my view is that it was worth it. We, there were too many unknown things that um and I, I think that the who itself has said that south africa did the right things but that i agree with nick is it's not a measure that we should willy-nilly take up to level five again when the second wave comes because i do think it is going to come i just want to take some comments here they're really interesting cecilia o'connor feels there should be a debt write-off nick because so many people are simply not going to be able to pay their debts. And we've seen that from low rental payments. Um, another one from Samantha Willen. During lockdown, many of us turned to online shopping and that has sent uh, many small businesses to the wall. What do we do about that? Uh, Lance could say, I think this was on tax, Nick. You can't be serious. This government's incapable of providing leadership. Um, and then a question from John Batwell. Um, there's so much talk of when is the walk about to start and how with our international bad, uh, bad school report with the depth of corruption. I think this is about when is um, when are people going to go to jail. I think we've had big news this week, two major cases, but, uh, uh, Bosasa and the Free State Asbestos case, certainly very big arrests. And I think we'll soon begin to see politicians also doing that uh, perp walk. Um, but Nick, just to look again at how that um, social relief of distress grant, only 350 Rand per month, but how it was almost targeted perfectly once people began to receive that amount. How, what was its impact on ordinary lives, is the research telling us? 
Sure. So, I mean, firstly, is to recognize that that was a really amazing achievement. Uh, that SASA, you know, a department that we don't think is particularly skillful amongst the government departments, yeah. um, at least externally, I can, we can say this outside of government. It's really, a, it's really quite an amazing thing that during a lockdown, they managed to pay out grants to 4 million recipients to verify them digitally, to triangulate the results with government, with SARS, the tax agency, to make sure, have they, are they already receiving a grant? There's a lot of work to do, uh, where normally they were based on people would come to the office physically, which obviously couldn't happen under a pandemic. So the fact that that managed to happen is really remarkable, and I think government deserves a lot right. of credit for that. The research is showing that it's well targeted, so it is going to the poorest uh, half of the population, yes. almost no one in the wealthiest 10% of the population is getting that. Uh, and it does seem to be going to people that have lost their jobs as a result of um, COVID-19. Uh, so the fact that it's well targeted and that it is reaching such a large number of people that aren't benefiting from any other grant, I think is a really a good, uh, a really big accomplishment of government during the pandemic. But it's going to end at the end of October. I mean, so it's there's a big question. So it's yes. scheduled to end at the end of October, both the top grants to the Child Support Grant, Old Age Pension and Disability Grant, as well as this new grant. But there's a lot of activity within Treasury and Presidency at the moment to ask the question, should it end or should we extend this? The problem is that the longer you leave that door open, the harder it will be to shut. Yes, I, that's absolutely right. I'm sure that Tito Mbuweni sitting in Limpopo at the moment is making okay. that balance big time uh, and cooking while cooking yeah? so Stephen Anna Chellen says COVID's provided an ideal platform for government to get its house in order laying down the law enforcing what could be a starting point we could only build on and for me as we get towards the end I want to ask you a question that I hope is not career limiting right so stay you with the Minister of Basic Education facing what you do now um, luckily you've saved a lot of the, uh, the grade 12 learning what are the immediate things you would do to ensure that we have that three-year rebuild rather than a 10-year one? So I think uh, starting maybe with ECD, um, prior to lockdown, there was this announcement by the president of a function shift, shifting ECD from um, social development to basic education. I think that should be a major priority. It should remain a priority, uh, firstly, in terms of subsidies, so using similar um, successes that we've seen with these grants um, and targeting um, giving uh, these small businesses or these ECD centers that operate as businesses uh, the required yes. subsidies to allow them to function as soon as possible again to give relief to parents and families but not just as a short-term COVID-19 relief right so as a way of building a system of getting more ECD centers registered more in partnership between the private sector and the public sector and getting more information about where these centers are so that we're able to support and monitor them not just punish them by not giving them subsidies so i think the ecd conversation would be top top of mind top um, of your priorities. Yeah. yeah some things that we can make quickly considering how quickly we were able to work on the grants and then i think yes. in terms of um, basic education i'd say we, we need to keep communicating clearly and deliberately for multiple audiences, the low risk faced by children and the comparable risk faced by teachers. Teachers, of course, are adults and may have comorbidities, but are similarly at risk with the rest of the population. So they're not at special risk compared to everyone else. And so keeping teachers as well in schools working. Um, and then I think a big thing, uh, figuring out how to sustain this trimmed curriculum in a way that's sustainable, that is not about just short-term measures and okay. providing adequate support for teachers in classroom. We have new evidence or not so new, maybe emerging over the past five years about the kinds of classroom practices that work, lesson plans, graded readers, coaches in classroom, doing those things and doing them well. Um, I think we'll, we'll maybe take, yeah, as you're saying, two to three years, but we will reap those benefits in the long term. I hope it is this great reset for you. Um, Nick, so say you were sitting in Limpopo, you had two years of the finance minister. Um, how would your MTBPS look? What, would, what decision would you make by the end of October on grants? And if I may just ask you, what do you think the key factors or what are the key the ingredients we should put into an economic recovery action plan, which should be 
released one of these days? Sure. So, I mean, using uh, the Tito Moeni's uh, cooking analogy, I think the main yes. spice that needs to be put into this meal is time. Time is of the essence. We I mean, if I was there in Limpopo and advising whoever it is that's writing up that document, I'd say to them, in the same way when, when a new president comes in and they say, in my first 100 days, this is what I'm going to do, they need to say, we are starting the recovery plan today. In the first 100 days, we will do this. This many people, this many EPWP jobs, this many contracts issued, etc. Because if you set that deadline in motion, you can then crack the whip with all of your DDGs and MECs, etc. to say, we are meeting these targets. No, it doesn't matter that it's 5 p.m. and you still need to work. You're not going home. Make sure we reach mm. these targets. So I think that the most important thing at the moment is not to have this really slow and gradual uptick. It needs to be a, a bounce back, which means the government mm. needs, needs to get its ass into gear and get stuff out the door in these first 100 days. Very good. And what would you do about that uh, SRD grant, the Social Relief of Distress grant, which is due to end at the end of the month? Would you keep that going? Most definitely. I think that it's not politically, both not politically feasible to remove that grant, but more importantly, from a moral and humanitarian perspective, there are too many people that are so close to destitution that the top-up grants and these COVID grants, not just the COVID grants, also the top-ups, are really keeping people from extreme hunger, including children. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for you both uh, for sketching, I think, very visionary landscapes in a, in a difficult, what looks like a post-war environment. Many thanks to you from people on our chat. And yes, uh, colleagues who joined us, it will, the recording will be available if your, um, if your link got a bit wonky at times. And thank you to our Maverick Insiders who sponsored uh, today's seminar. And thank you both for your excellent research. I really enjoyed reading through it. Um, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye.